The opinions expressed in the following program are strictly those of the speakers. They do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. From the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin, this is Frontier. Discussions of today's most exciting research subjects by distinguished scientists and engineers working at the frontiers of knowledge. When I shared the news of this year's recipient, here's what I heard. Excellent choice. She's a gifted teacher and shapes so many young minds. She's loved by a generation of students. One of the reasons why she is so awesome is that while gaining administrative duties or engaging in public service, she always kept her commitment to the science, the real science, and to teaching throughout her career. She is widely respected. I adore Millie. Everyone loves Millie. She's the real deal. The National Science Board selected MIT Institute Professor Dr. Mildred Dresselhaus as its 2009 Vannevar Bush Award recipient. And they chose well. Her leadership through public service in science and engineering, her perseverance and advocacy for increasing opportunities for women, and for her extraordinary contributions to the field of condensed matter physics and nanoscience. This made her a great choice. She is the real deal. Millie is here at the National Science Foundation to accept her award tonight, and I'm thrilled to have her with us here in the studio. Thank you, Millie. And also joining us is another impressive woman, Dr. Patricia Galloway. Pat serves as Vice Chair of the National Science Board. She is also the Chief Executive Officer of Pegasus Global Holdings Incorporated, an international management consulting firm. An engineer, Pat Galloway was the first woman to serve as president of the American Society of Civil Engineering in the organization's 154-year history. Ladies, I'm awestruck. <laughs> Thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Lisa. Millie, you were a pioneer in a wide range of topics in condensed matter materials and physics. I once heard you call the queen of carbon for your work on carbon science and carbon nanostructures. What's that all about? Well, i tell you what it's about, and I can also tell you how I got there. I'd love to hear. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know that in physics, one does PhD before you actually start your professional career, and often a postdoc. So, uh, and that part of my career was in superconductivity, which is another area of uh, condensed matter physics. And uh, so in that field, I, I was looking for some way that I could make measurements on superconductors because, as you know, they have no resistivity. So, uh, but if you go up in frequency, instead of doing it at uh, just direct current, but you increase the frequency of the waves, then you could measure some impedance. So that's what I went out to do, and I was doing studies at microwave frequencies and observed some interesting results, and so that sort of got me my first job, so to speak. Uh, but then when I did get my first job, I was told to change fields. <laughs> so everything I knew, you know, went sort of out the board, and I started <laughs> Next. doing something else. Right, you know, that, that's the way science is sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was asked if I would like to uh, work in the field of, of magneto-optics. And so, yeah, that is, I didn't know anything about it, of course. And uh, it's, that, that's the wonderful thing about science, is that when you're a student, you learn enough about many things that you can move from one area to another very easily. So uh, that helped me. And, uh, but uh, then I started working in this field very much the way other people were, were attacking it. And most of the topics were about semiconductors. And it seemed to me that what people were doing were almost the same as what other people were doing. Mm. And I, I never liked doing the same as other people. <laughs> I wanted to do my own thing. So my husband 
suggested to me that maybe I should look in the area of carbon. And the reason was that uh, he was um, one of the people that discovered cyclotron resonance, which is a very important topic in condensed matter of physics. That was what his PhD thesis was about. And one of the materials he tried was carbon, oh. so graphite. So he, he, had a, he had some kind of in on this. In with the carbon <laughs> yeah, folks. Yeah, <laughs> right. And he suggested that maybe I should try that with magneto optics. So uh, anyway, the gods were shining on me because just at the time I started this work, a theory was developed just at the right time for mm -hmm. me. Not only that, but a material of sufficient size and perfection was for the first time synthesized. Mm -hmm. So I had theory, I had materials, so just the scene was set, oh. so, so, to say, so to speak. So that's how I got into this field. And it was sort of my field because everybody that I met thought it was too hard. <laughs> it was not attractive to other people. My so. guess is that you didn't think it was too hard. Well, I, I was going to work at it, and, and I did. And, well, the rest is history because uh, it was rather exper a successful experiment and led to my becoming a professor at MIT. Um, it was really the work that I had done in carbon science more than anything else that got me my professorship. So I was appointed uh, as a full professor. That's when I came to MIT. Mm -hmm. so it, was, it was lucky. Ah, oh, and MIT was lucky as well. <laughs> well, I had these wonderful students, so you know that made life so interesting. You students. are you are just proclaimed the most wonderful teacher. Well, it's because I love teaching, and uh, see, I, I, that's another part of me that you didn't ask, but I I can mention. Please. how I got into that because when I went to uh, college in the beginning at that time there were only three opportunities for women school teaching or being a secretary or being a nurse that was it so well that was those were my choices and school teaching sounded much more like me so that was my number so I thought I'd try that mm -hmm. so I went to Hunter College to be a school teacher and there, because I had very good background, I could juggle many things. I took a lot of science courses while I was learning how to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. So that, that worked out well because oh. I've used my teaching totally well, and my, my whole career. So. And you're obviously very, very successful at well, it. I think the most important thing with teaching is to like it mm. and, and to enjoy your students and to have a relation with them that they're the most important that you out there to teach them. My guess is, based on the comments that I heard, Pat, <laughs> Millie's success in teaching was a big part of her selection for this award. Tell me a little bit more about how the award um, was bestowed upon her, how she was selected, and in general about the National Science Board. Well, the National Science Board, uh, we're 25 members. We are appointed by the President of the United States. We're all Senate confirmed, six-year terms. And the vision of the National Science Board, of course, is to provide oversight to the National Science Foundation, set policy, and also serve as an advisor to the President and Congress on issues involving science in engineering. And when we looked at the Vannevar Bush Award, and when we look at who exemplifies that award, you, in your your public service dealings, your, uh, the carbon science that has basically been a lifelong goal of yours for 50 some odd years, your ability to, to draw in students and to get them enthusiastic about studying. I mean, mm -hmm. all of that went a long way relative to our considerations of bestowing the award upon you. And, and we, we absolutely believe that you're a model and a role model for not only uh, women, but, but everyone wanting to go into science and engineering because of the very enthusiasm that you've just shown us here today, which is just fantastic. Well, thank, thank you. <laughs> now, Millie, yeah. I understand for you, Vannevar Bush is more than the name that will appear on your medal. You yeah. have your own special relationship. <laughs> Please yeah. share with us. Well, guess what? I work in a building called the Vannevar Bush Building, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it has its name outside the building. 
Not only that, when you enter the building, the first thing you see is a picture of Vannevar Bush, yeah. and he has a big smile on his face, <laughs> and there he is working on his lathe. Nope. Wow. And oh, it's actually a milling machine I think that we have there. And uh, so he's making some kind of gadget, but he's looking at us. And not only that, uh, I have worked in, in this exact room that was assigned to me after I came to MIT, was, was, which was one of his rooms that he actually was working in when he was a professor some years before me, <laughs> <laughs> but the same department wow. at MIT. So this is really kind of a coincidence. Wow. It's an added gem to us. I mean, really. I mean, we had no idea. We didn't, we didn't know. No, we didn't at all. <laughs> well, how would you know? <laughs> it's an added bonus. <laughs> That's right. What do you think Vannevar Bush would think looking at you and looking at your achievements? In, in the day, women really did not achieve in the areas of science. Well, I, I think he would be really happy about it. And, uh, you know, there are uh, many reasons. Uh, when you think about his own contributions, uh, I think that his uh, scientific contributions were kind of top in his thinking all the time, as they are for me. And the, but he always had something in the back of his mind of service because um, he was so influential in the U.S. in leading the war effort, science mm -hmm. and, and technology, and doing it very well. Before that, of course, he did similar kinds of things at MIT mm -hmm. because you wouldn't do this for the whole nation without some prior experience. So, uh, Therefore, I, I think that the combination of, of science, technology, and putting it to some practical use that people care about, uh, I think that would go over really well with him. And, um, and it goes over with something that I learned in my very early years when I was a student at Hunter College. And I was with the idea of becoming a school teacher as a uh, service to the community and service to the nation. And, you know, more than that, even service to the world, because when you do science and technology, you, you can make contributions in many areas, and you're asked to do that. That's for sure. Um, your beginnings were modest. You're from the Bronx. <laughs> um, right. In a somewhat economically challenging situation, Tell me, yet your success is so incredible. How did that come to be? What was your path like early? Okay, yeah, early. My parents were immigrants, and you know, we have many people coming to the, into, into science and technology whose parents are immigrants, or they are the immigrants themselves, you know. Mm -hmm. All of those things we, we know, and they're successful at it. So uh, how did I get there? Well, for me, the, the route was a little bit circuitous, but uh, uh, I was a music student when I was a very early child, young child, and um, I had a violin scholarship when I just about the time I started school. And the reason that that happened was because I had a very talented brother who was a child prodigy, so they figured, you know, I would be another one. So. Uh, and that was really a good thing. The, the, what that has to do with science and, and, and technology is that through this experience of, of being a music student, I got to meet people from all economic and social conditions. So I met middle class people and people that were in the upper class of society. Everybody was there. And so I got an idea of, of what are some of the goals of people and what, what, what are aspiration levels because I never would see that in my own community. Mm. So that, that was th the biggest influence that happened. Of course, I, I learned to play the violin yeah. and I still enjoy that now, so I'm an active player. Oh, so, well, that's excellent. so, you know, all of this, of course, has stayed with me. It's part of me and my life and my family. We all play together, so that's been uh, very, very nice. So anyway, through this experience, I, I, I changed my, my whole attitudes and my aspiration level grew. And um, I got, 
I was always interested in, in studying, um, but I got, the, I got a lot more motivation, self-motivation, and um, the idea of self-teaching that, that I think came largely through, uh, through the music experience. But you know, um, when, when you're a very young child, there aren't too many things that you encounter that you have to learn to a, a rather high level of perfection. Mm. And, uh, and what music does is it gives you, at an early age, some goals where you ac actually have to meet the line. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that is one aspect of education that's really important. Mm -hmm. And of course, the idea that in the U United States, they have scholarship aid for students with ability and no means. Mm -hmm. So. I think we have to think about the virtues and uh, advantages of being a citizen of this country. Not every place in the world can you do as much with a low level uh, start as you can here. Mm. And, the, and the NSF promotes this. Oh, most certainly. Last year I had the honor of interviewing the 2008 Vannevar Bush Award winner, Norm Augustine. And he too was a child of immigrants and his chosen profession for that reason, to please his parents, to pre please his community, was engineering. Pat, what do you think of that model? Was that what inspired you at all? Well, I have to admit there's a lot of similarity. I didn't know the music part was part of uh, your background, but I too, I had no idea what engineering was. I was in the drama club. I was. Um, I was a big hiker, I was a dancer, I danced for like uh, 18 years, uh, ballet and tap, and I, and I was very much into the arts. I was a, as an artist and I drew, and so I, I actually wanted to either be a interior designer uh, or a lawyer, maybe an interpreter for the UN. I was taking Spanish, I had taken Latin, I was getting ready to take French. But I hate uh, that too. <laughs> oh well, see, there's a lot of commonalities there, and I also grew up. My my grandfather, one grandfather, worked for the county road department. One worked in the coal mines in Kentucky. Uh, came up through a very eastern Kentucky. My dad was from Hazard. He was a music major. Uh, my mother played clarinet. They uh, they met in the music uh, band in college, oh. and so it was. But it was the teaching part that you mentioned that is what got me and interested in engineering. When I was a junior in high school, it was mandated that I sit in this big auditorium for career day. Um, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, and I sat in the back of the room and didn't want to care. And they said it was going to be on engineering. And I'm thinking, I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what that is. And this professor from the University of Kentucky, he got up and he put all these beautiful renderings of buildings on the wall. Of course, he probably exaggerated. That was probably architectural renderings, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll give him that little credit. Details. Mm -hmm. And he got my attention because he, he put in the art aspects of engineering mm -hmm. and why it was the art of the future and why it was so important for young people to be involved. And of course, I raised my hand and I went, wow, do civil engineers do that? And he was very enthusiastic because he said, yes, and you as a young lady, we need ladies into the engineering profession. Mm -hmm. So I went home and told my mom I wanted to be an engineer. Of course, she was a school teacher herself. She was like, oh, that's great. She always supported me. Anything I ever wanted to do, she would support me. But then that's when, when I went to my guidance counselor, the guidance counselor said, oh, that's a bad idea. You didn't score well enough on your aptitude test to be an engineer. And then I went to my math teacher, and she said, oh, that's a bad idea. You'll flunk out. You haven't had physics or chemistry or calculus. And then I went home to my grandmother, who said, isn't that a man's job? <laughs> I was bound and determined to be an engineer at that point. But it's that drive, and it, it gave me a drive that I wanted to make sure that everything I did going forward was in a role model position so that young girls or anyone didn't think that they, quote, had to have an IQ of 100 and, you know, 62, 200 to be an engineer. That anyone with any creativity could be an engineer. And so I think a lot of your stories of how you came into, into this and your background 
has a lot of similarity, I think, for the engineers that I meet and scientists that I meet that are very creative mm -hmm. and who are very um, outspoken and, and want to bring in more people into the, the mix of a, making an exciting career. And so I, I think that's an important but once point you, you bring. Once, once you get into it, you're absolutely passionate about absolutely. it. Absolutely. You can't tell that we are passionate at all, it's can you? Absolutely <laughs> obvious. And it's contagious. I think we all share that desire to um, engage in science and to teach science, teach appreciation and to teach the science itself. Well, what does the profession look like today? Um, you mentioned the diversity. Is it, are women fairly represented? Is it getting better? Maybe a few comments. Well, I could well, start. Us from science. I, I, I could start because uh, uh, You've seen the I've, most I've seen it for a longer time. <laughs> yes. So when I got my PhD, we were 2% <sighs> of uh, uh, PhDs. Women were 2% of PhDs in physics when I got my PhD. And so what does that mean? That means that when you're in a classroom, you are the only woman in the class, so we know that. And then when you're a, a teacher, professor, later when I became a professor, I would teach to all male classes. Wow. And sometimes I would have one woman in the class, and around that woman were, was a ring of empty seats. Oh, yes. The guys wouldn't sit near, wow. near her. Yeah, but that has changed. Now uh, at MIT, we're 40, five, seven percent um, undergraduates are women. Wow. And they are in the classroom, so we see them, and they do wonderfully. So there's no apologies for having them there. And they've changed the place. Yeah. They've made, made the place a lot more fun for everybody. Now in the physics profession, what about, what does it look like on the professional level? Well, well you know. Outside of the classroom. Yes. Uh, the, the biggest um, barrier is the high school college interface. Mm -hmm. at, at, in the, the high schools now, 40 some percent of the students are female. So the class is half and half mm -hmm. by any way of think, thinking about it. However, the transition to freshman physics is different. Freshman physics doesn't have 50%. But every year it's getting more, mm -hmm. and the students are doing better. And um, once you get into, say, uh, college or, or graduate programs, uh, the the pathway is continuous. Mm -hmm. So the we don't we don't tend in, not in the U.S. anyway. We don't tend to lose very many women from physics relative to men mm -hmm. as it moves on, but. The big, big tra transition point is the entry point in college, and uh, physics is just thought to be hard. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, I would say that, I wouldn't call it hard, I would call it interesting. So, you know, we all work at it, and we try very hard to understand it, because that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's the beauty of it, and that's what we love so much about it, mm -hmm. to figure it all out. Pat, how about engineering? It's a little different than science. Science has taken off a little bit, and in the engineering, it really depends on the school, of course, but on a national average, we, we're actually going back down in enrollment. It reached a peak of about 19.1% in all disciplines of engineering. Of course, some disciplines of engineering have more women, like environmental engineering tends to pull more women into it than, say, nuclear engineering or even electrical, which has lower inputs of, uh, of women engineering. But we're seeing that decline. And like last year, it was only like 16% enrollment of, on a nationwide average of women into engineering. But on the, the professional side, it's even worse. When I graduated in 78, um, we had 10% women in the engineering workforce. Today, 30 years later, we have 10% women mm -hmm. in the engineering workforce. There has been zero increase. And we also see a problem with the high school um, college interface. We actually see a bigger problem in the K through 12 education in the image of the engineer and what does an engineer look like. Three years ago on a National Science Foundation grant, actually, the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers as secretariat formed this 
um, this organization called the Extraordinary Women Engineers Project, which I was very fortunate to be asked to, uh, to chair. And we went around and interviewed thousands of, of high school girls, age 14 to 17, all around the United States from different backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, um, you know, private schools, public schools, different financial backgrounds. And we asked them you know, why they weren't going in engineering. They were already excelling. They were already at the top of their class in math and in science in the school. So they were prime candidates to select engineering. Number one response, oh, do I look like a geek? <laughs> mm. And and then a, so it's a, just a big image thing. It's an yeah. image thing, and we've got to figure out how to have like the the CSI, you know, the the Hollywood version, which has pulled people in to that particular aspect of science and has increased dramatically. We need that for engineering. We need some Hollywood imagery to demonstrate that it's exciting. It's fun and that uh, we all don't run around with white lab coats and big black glasses and pocket protectors. And <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't look like you, the three of us. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yep. That's right. And I think, the image, I think the image is changing somewhat in that at least um, our president is very supportive yes. of science and of resources, devoting resources to science and engineering. Are you hopeful? No. Oh, oh I, I absolutely am, yes. Uh, I think that's certainly genuine, and, uh, but it's needed because, I mean, we're the engine that keeps the country going. We have uh, new industries and uh, new directions. So and, and when you think of all the things that are important in, in our lives, uh, they, we didn't have them 100 years ago, and that's all come from science and, and technology. So uh, we are important. and. and and we do. We get a chance to do what we love to do, and that there are enough people out there that that just want to do this. So now, Pat, yeah. President Obama even was more specific regarding engineers. In fact, he was. He said in his book, *The Audacity of Hope*, when he was then a senator, that he can imagine or hope for a day in which kids would want to be engineers instead of lawyers, and there would be, in fact, more engineers. Than lawyers, what do you think? Can you imagine? Not such only a do day? I think that's mm -hmm. a great idea, but I'm hoping that he allows his two daughters the opportunity <laughs> to meet with engineers uh, and scientists, and, and maybe you know maybe he should meet with Millie and I. I mean, uh, to get his daughters very encouraged uh, in the profession. But he has an opportunity to be able to show and demonstrate his enthusiasm for science and engineering and technology and to be able to take his daughters and encourage them to do the same. I, I think that we see a, a family situation here in an, uh, as an opportunity for our nation because we're at a key point that we must excel in science and engineering. We must push our, our country forward. The infrastructure is requiring engineers quite a bit and we don't actually believe that we're going to have enough engineers to do what needs to be done. Engineers or people in the physical sciences goes along with that. Exactly. Uh, and uh, in fact, I was brought to MIT for just that mm -hmm. because during World War II, as you know, uh, the top jobs often didn't go to engineers, but they went mm -hmm. to scientists because all the things that were needed to win the war, so to speak, mm -hmm required new ideas and the engineers just didn't have the background to to move in those directions so they had to work very closely with the science community mm. so the idea was to give more science to the engineers to enable them so they could do more and work in new directions and bring new more an engine for creativity mm. Well, I think an engine for creativity is the United States' ability to compete internationally. Now, both of you have significant international recognition. Millie, I understand you have some 25 honorary degrees worldwide from worldwide institutions. And Pat, you've been to over 100 countries. How are we doing in the United States in our science area, science and engineering areas and physics? Well, it, it, this is a, a it, not a, a one-dimensional question. No, no, no. <laughs> when, I ask big questions. <laughs> yeah. So when you, when you when you you're looking at, at the top journals and who's publishing there, and um, where the great universities are and the very best people, 
we do well in that metric. On those metrics, there's more than one that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. But when you uh, look at a performance of high school students or um, other metrics of what the mean mm -hmm. knowledge base of an eighth grade or 12th grade student, we don't come out quite as well mm -hmm. in those metrics. And uh, I think that many of the issues that are involved is that uh, young kids don't have enough love for learning. Mm -hmm. And we have to inculcate that. So it's up to the teachers to make learning more exciting, get the kids so that they, this is what I really want to do. Yes, oh, and, absolutely. And you have been successful in doing so. How do you reach them? Well, I, I, I spent my whole career in teaching, except when I was very young, in teaching very gifted students, so that's easy. Ah, well, it's never <laughs> easy. <laughs> yeah. well, it's, <laughs> Teaching's not an easy job. Maybe it's easier. <laughs> But um, y you have one thing going for you. These kids really want to learn. Mm -hmm. And if you have something to offer, they're right there. But my very first student was uh, a first grader, and I was in third grade. So, ah. OK, <laughs> that was my first paying job. Ah, ah. Yes. you were a paid tutor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 50 cents a whole week every wow. afternoon. That was not very good pay by today's standards. But it seemed pretty good at that time. So you're a yeah. scientist and an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. <laughs> and doesn't that We're speak to the need? Right. Doesn't that speak to the need for women to be multifaceted? And yeah. maybe, maybe we can talk a little bit about the need for a science training and education, even if one does not go on to pursue graduate degrees well, in PhDs in science. In, for example, the U.S. has a, a dire need for um, teachers in the physical sciences. In physics classroom, perhaps half the teachers are not qualified mm -hmm. by traditional mm -hmm. standards relative to certainly what, what uh, is available in most other countries mm. that we compete with. So this is, this is one area that we could improve on oh, and okay. produce uh, more qualified um, teachers at the high school level. It's a, it's a fun job. And the need for engineers is not just limited to the United States, and, and I think that... Well, uh, we work w worldwide, you know, yes, when we're working, so... Absolutely, and one of the, the World uh, Federation of Engineering Organizations, uh, termed more um, WFEO to a lot of people that, uh, that participate, but it brings all the countries in from all over the world for, for engineering, and the very same issues that we're facing here many other nations are, are facing. Yeah, because they watch TV and they see how they look at <laughs> us. <laughs> <laughs> but they also look they at uh, some of the uh, bad things from that's us. That's true. I mean, climate change is an issue that can't be sur solved by one nation. Exactly. Um, natural disasters cannot be solved by one nation. Um, these require collaborative efforts, both from university collaboration and research to engineers working together. And I think it, I think the international collaborations are going to be extremely important as we as we move forward into the future of solving some of these issues that uh, that can impact one nation, but actually have its genesis somewhere else around the globe. Yeah, or or our global problems. Energy is a global. Problem. That's right. Yeah. Collaborations are critical across national boundaries, certainly, but increasingly across disciplines. Have yes. either of you or both of you had the opportunity to work on interdisciplinary endeavors? Uh, well, you know, my field is very interdisciplinary. Uh, you know, the uh, condensed matter and materials physics requires somebody to make something. Mm -hmm. So that's <laughs> chemistry <laughs> right there. And then we have applications, and that's engineering. So we span quite a few things. And, um, and what we do has implications for the life sciences, because life sciences have, have atoms and molecules and all of that. So that's part of what we do. And there's order in them and disorder. disorder. We're, <laughs> we're, we're interested in both aspects in, in my field. <coughs> so interdisciplinarity is is where we're going. Right. You know, we, maybe 100 years we were more physics, chemistry, but now we, we're mixing things up. 
phenomena at the nanoscale are all fields. Mm. And I would agree. I mean, engineering specifically used to be known as a, as a silo profession. You have civils, mechanicals, electricals, but they were all separate silos. But now with what we call the smart projects, take, a, take an in what we call intelligent highway system. An intelligent highway system will go through if our one pass and our smart passes as we breeze through these toll stations. All of that involves... Isn't that wonderful? Oh, it's just fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> no that, in, that involves electricity. So it's, you know, it's involved in electrical engineers and civil engineers yeah. and mechanical systems for mechanical engineers. But and computing. It, it, computing, which we bring in mm -hmm. the computer engineers. And it's also finally bringing in the social management systems as well mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. how does this in, impact everyone's daily life? I mean, people going through those tollways are not necessarily engineers, mm -hmm. but how is that impacting them? And how do they react to it? That's correct. That's and and correct. How, how upset do they get when they have to wait on long lines? And that's that's right. That's right. So all you know, social systems, I think, is being become a critical aspect of both science and engineering. Everything that we do needs to take into consideration more of what the public needs, what are their needs, what are their their wants, their desires, how do they participate more in these projects? I think that's going to become increasingly important as we as we move into the 21st century further. I think need is certainly one of the sources of inspiration for scientists. They want to meet societal needs. You all clearly yes. have a desire to meet societal needs. But what else? What else fuels you? I've heard and I love to hear the stories from scientists who experience a so-called aha moment, <laughs> a moment in their research in which there's clarity or discovery or something new or something surprising. I know you women have appreciate, you know, have, have experienced and appreciate such. Could you share with us? Well, aha moments we have <laughs> at some level, aha moments come at least once a week uh -huh. <laughs> uh, because it, when you're working on a problem at the cutting edge you always have a surprise i mean i do that's great and i'm working with my students and i say did you really find this let me look at your data <laughs> so that we start looking over uh, you know all the recordings of uh, of the phenomenon uh -huh. to see that it's really there and what is the noise level and are you s signaled to noise and all these kind of issues, yeah, wow. we get into that. And, but there's another thing that I wanted to say uh, that came up from your field, civil engineering. You think mm -hmm. civil engineering doesn't have a whole lot to do with physics. But um, right now, in your field, there's a great emphasis on environmental issues. That's correct. And choosing uh, routes for, uh, uh, say, material synthesis mm -hmm. that are environmentally benign and I would say that you have given us a great deal of sensitivity that we didn't have before for example there are many routes to make carbon nanotubes you know that's mm -hmm. one of the big crazes now in nanoscience right, right. and um, so you start out with some some um, beginning materials you know raw materials mm -hmm. that you start with maybe methane and you're going to split that and um, release the hydrogen and you have carbon and then that will somehow form the kind of solid that we want, which is a, mm -hmm. a, a nanoscale um, assembly with a certain ordering that we were looking for. Okay, that's the goal. But the, there are effluents that come off in the reaction products when you make this and some of them could be toxic. And mm -hmm. uh, I would say that uh, because of the influence of the environmental movement uh, and people doing degrees in, in civil engineering, we, ha we see some of that now impacting on what we're doing. They're looking at the effluence, you know, what goes off in the oh, atmosphere. Yes, right. right. And, and uh, w w the impact, of course, is to look for uh, synthesis routes mm -hmm. that uh, uh, limit the emissions of, of toxic side, side reactions. And at the same time, hopefully also increasing the yield of the product that you're looking for. Oh, that's so, absolutely right. So, so in the end, you may come out much, much happier. Mm -hmm. But uh, much of this is an influence from 
the civil engineering community. Well, that's great and to hear. <laughs> I really appreciate I, 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 that. Well, I was uh, invited for a PhD exam. I didn't think I had any anything to do there, but uh, this uh, female student actually getting a PhD was uh, a, a component of the thesis was about synthesis of carbon nanotubes. Oh. So they wanted somebody to do something about carbon nanotubes. That was me. So <laughs> and the queen of carbon, <laughs> yeah, stepped <laughs> up. <laughs> so I got I got in there, and it was the, it was really quite, kind of interesting for me too. But yeah. would you say there were others who were your mentors? Yes. Uh, well, um, when what uh, some of my big mentors were um, my early science teachers in college, and uh, because that that's a very critical time. Uh, when, when you start college, you have absolutely no idea uh, what your relative ability is and even what you're interested in because most of the things that are out there that you encounter in college, you have no idea about That's right. mm -hmm. uh, um, when you're a high school student. Cause they, you can't just, even imagine their jobs. You, can't, you can't, can't imagine the phenomenon. You can't imagine all the fields. So uh, the early uh, college training is, is so important. Uh, well, one of the people that was very um, influential in my life, I think, is almost a popular fi a figure, and that's Enrico Fermi. Oh, Many people yes. have heard about his name. Of course. And so I, I was actually a student of his. Uh, oh, so, really? Yes, I was. And so he was a phenomenal teacher, I absolutely bet. phenomenal teacher. And uh, he spoke very, very, very slowly. Uh, uh, and he wrote every, things on the blackboard by hand. I and, would appreciate and, that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think that in physics, that that's not so bad because yeah. it gives mm -hmm. you time to think. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> and and, and uh, the er, at the end of every class, there was a problem, mm. and the problem was so simple sounding, and then when you s sat down to do it, you you realize the depth of this problem, mm. <laughs> that it could be years uh, wow. to solve it. But of course, we were just looking for a, a, a quick solution, not, not the most deep uh. thinking. But uh, I think that these kinds of experiences are really important in getting you to think uh, outside the box and That's think sure. deeply. So he had a big, very big influence on me. But unfortunately, he died one year after we met oh. because that was the very end of his career. He uh -huh. had a very short life, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, another person that was very influential in my uh, life was another Nobel laureate. But at the time, uh, she couldn't get a job. So she was teaching at Hunter College. Oh. And we met, and she, uh, in my second year, she was my teacher in the class. And we had a small class. She knew everybody. And uh, because she knew everybody, she had individual mentoring of everybody. <laughs> That's a good thing to do. Oh, and I, special. I, I, yeah, yeah I, 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 I've learned about that. Yeah, that influenced me, too, in my teaching. So th those two people in influenced me in physics, and they influenced me also in teaching. And uh, what was her uh, name? Rosalind Yellow. And uh, she was a physicist who got a Nobel Prize in medicine, wow. 1977. Um, and uh, her, her story is, is really pretty much incredible. But I knew her in the very early years, and she couldn't get a job. And finally, she got a job working for the Veterans Administration. Mm -hmm. Her field was nuclear physics, wow. but was, she was working for the Veterans Administration. She, she found a way to do nuclear physics there because there's uh. is radioisotopes. Wow. And she found uh, use for radioisotopes in medicine. Mm. And, and uh, figuring out how to use the different kind of isotopes to figure out things that happen biologically and trace uh, disease patterns and so forth. Uh. So Ingenuity. Yeah, oh. yeah. Ingenuity is what really matters in this whole business. And to make something out of... Um, kind of a bad situation that you find yourself in. And for women in early years, it was very difficult to start a career. And so you did what you could and try to make the best of it. And sometimes the, the best was really very good. <laughs> so. 
Do yeah. you have any, any areas in which you wish you could do over? You sound so optimistic, I can't imagine. But maybe something you'd like another run at. No, not really. Yeah, <laughs> I can tell. Not, not, not really. Not that I've done everything so wonderfully. No, but, of course not. But uh, uh, I, one thing that I, I emphasize in mentoring students, and I've had many students both in the classroom and in research uh, situations, um, I really emph emphasize uh, um, surviving and recovering from uh, bad situations. Mm. And uh, I in life, you encounter many unexpected uh, disappointments. And uh, being able to analyze what caused that disappointment yes. and how to recover from it on a different level is what makes a person. So I found that is maybe the most important thing that I can accomplish in mentoring students is helping them when they have disappointments how uh, to wise. recover recover and go forward that's a really good point and that's also kind of an and interesting that's very important also for doing research because most of the time mm -hmm. things don't work right and uh, so then you have to figure out a way to make them work because in the end that they do work but you have to get there mm. well similar to that point I think we're spending some time looking back to move forward we're about to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the National Science Foundation. Plans ahead. Pat, I understand that you're the co-chair of this effort for the National I, Science Board. I am. I am. And we are, we are mm. planning some very, very interesting things. And in fact, we're hoping uh, that we will get accepted at the uh, AAAS annual meeting uh, for next, uh, next February to have a panel where we will talk about all I'm, sh I'm the sure they'll accept that. <laughs> well, <laughs> very, we hope. We hope. <laughs> very important thing. But we would like to highlight, you know, what are the 60 great achievements that have happened over the past 60 years? But as you said, on learning going forward, we're hoping to do the same thing. Of those 60 great achievements, how can we look forward and say, taking that into consideration, what are our future opportunities? What do we think that might be out there in the future as well that we can, you know, set a foundation for and to make this, again, very exciting opportunity? So we're, we're hoping to do a little bit of, of both of that by celebrating the past but learning from the past as we transform and transition into the future to make sure that we get new blood, new researchers, um, encourage young people to continue to submit those proposals for research and to think out of the box, as you said. I mean, we want to think, what is it that's out there that we may not even know about yet? Mm. Yeah, well, I, I think that we know something about what to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that it, it, much of the innovation starts with the individual. Mm -hmm. So, um, giving freedom to individuals is, I think, a key parameter mm -hmm. uh, in this. I think most people will tell you that. Now, if you, you know in engineering, if you want to get a job done, you need a team in the end. That's correct. But, uh, but the, um, the seeds for mm -hmm. the direction you move doesn't often come from big teams. It comes from some, some key member. That's right. That figures it out, you know, what you want to do next. So, Melly, mm -hmm. what will you tell the ne or what will you tell the next generation? What do we want to do next? In in science, or or training yourself for science. <laughs> it is your choice. Well, yeah. Well, I think for young people, uh, for any career, whether it's science or or not science, is uh, a broad education is the the key. I would say because that allows you to put many, many things together in, your own, in how your own brain works, you know, and, uh, and that's the level at which the individuality will come through. So you have to learn some things in depth and, uh, and many things somewhat so that you can put, a, put this whole thing together in your own inimitable way <laughs> that, that's, that's kind of unique. I, um, I think that that's the most important thing a professor teaches is not facts, but how to do si how to do science, and to uh, come up with um, original work. 
Mm -hmm. I would say that um, kind of the key thing to teach. So uh, in doing this, uh, it's nice to get the professor up at the blackboard and, uh, and throw out a question that they've never thought about. And uh, mm -hmm. that is a very good experience for the professor and the students. <laughs> That's right, because you're too. learning too, because yeah. you have no idea what they're going to no, say. No, but, but what, they, what they follow with that is they could see how you explore things that you mm -hmm. don't know anything about. Because that is the most important thing to learn, more so mm -hmm. than the facts themselves. Millie, you've been an inspiration. It's been such a joy and an honor to speak with you today. And Pat, thank you as well. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you, Lisa. This <laughs> has been fun, and I look forward really to seeing you fun. tonight as My well. My guess is we're going to keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> but to our audience, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Lisa Joy Zagorski with the National Science Foundation. Mm -hmm.